Hi everyone, today we will be discussing sodium. Sodium is a mineral and it is an essential mineral that we need for life. It does help the body to control its fluid balance. It's involved in the balance of pH. It's involved in muscle contraction and relaxation, nerve transmission and function. So we do need some sodium, but we only need less than 500 milligrams per day. And the problem is, is that currently we're taking in much more than we need and in amounts that are detrimental to our health. So what's the big deal? Well, we know that excessive intakes of sodium are linked to an increased risk for heart failure, stroke, and high blood pressure. So it definitely impacts our heart. How excessive sodium is linked to high blood pressure is that sodium and salt causes us to retain fluid and retain water. And our heart has to increase the pressure in order to pump out all of this extra volume and fluid. So think about a garden hose. If you want more water to come out of that hose, you have to increase the pressure pressure and the water will come flying out. Well, with our heart, in order to pump out all of that extra volume that you're retaining because of the sodium, we have to increase the pressure in the arteries. But you may not also know that excessive sodium is linked to other diseases such as headaches, kidney disease and kidney stones, osteoporosis, and stomach cancer. And that water retention can cause you feeling puffy, bloating, and can cause weight gain. But 9 out of 10 Americans are consuming too much sodium. That's 90% of us. So we definitely have some work to do in this area. The recommended limits on sodium come from the American Heart Association, and their 2013 Lifestyle Management Guideline states that we should be aiming for no more than 2,300 milligrams of sodium per day, but that a further reduction to 1,500 milligrams is ideal. So they're giving you a little bit of a window. You know, the most desirable target is 1,500, but the absolute amount that you should not go over is 2,300 milligrams per day. So if your blood pressure is currently out of control and you're really struggling with that, you really want to be going towards the lower end of this goal of 1,500 milligrams. Now, even reducing sodium from your current intake can still help lower blood pressure, even if you don't meet these goals. So if you're having a very excessive amount right now, just lowering by 1,000 milligrams per day can still have a meaningful impact. So it's not all or nothing. Don't be discouraged if you can't meet these recommendations because any reduction in sodium from where you are is a step in the right direction and can still be beneficial. Now let's take a look at current sodium intake in the United States. And this data comes from the most recent version of the Dietary Guidelines for Americans. So on the left, this is the current intake of sodium in the age group of 31 to 59. In orange, that is the percentage of people that are exceeding the sodium limit of 2,300 milligrams per day. So in that age group of 31 to 59, 97% of males and 82% of females are exceeding the sodium recommendations. In our older adults, ages 60 and older, 94% of males and 72% of females are exceeding the sodium limit. On this slide, you can also see that we have the average intakes by age group and by gender. So the average intake for a male age 31 to 59 is 4,172 milligrams per day. For females, it's over 3,000 milligrams per day. For our older adults in the male category, average intake of sodium is 3,799 milligrams per day. And for the older females, it's 2,802 milligrams per day. So now that we've identified that most Americans are overconsuming sodium, we need to figure out where all the sodium is coming from. How is this happening that we're taking in so much? So more than 70% of American sodium intake comes from processed foods and restaurant foods. So these are things that we're buying at the grocery store that are already prepared or are already processed, meaning altered from their original form, like frozen dinners and pre-seasoned dinners like rice pilaf, hamburger helper, uh, canned soups, deli meats, 
um, snack type products. Those are all processed foods and restaurant foods. This includes takeout. This includes, you know, the hot bar um, at the grocery store. So 70% over that amount comes from processed food and restaurants. Only 10% of our sodium is coming from salt that's added while cooking or while eating the food. And 15% of our sodium intake comes naturally occurring in foods since we do have sodium, you know, in our soil and in our environment. There are some foods that have naturally occurring sodium. So if you see that on the label, but there's no ingredients indicating that salt has been added, it's naturally occurring sodium. So anyway, looking at this picture, where we need to focus our energy is clearly on reducing our intake of processed foods and restaurant foods, basically reducing food that we do not prepare ourselves. This chart here more specifically breaks it down into the type of foods that are contributing to our excessive sodium intake. So for people ages one and older, the most sodium that we get actually comes from sandwiches. So think about those 12 inch subs people are getting with, you know, Italian meats, pepperoni, salami, ham, deli meat all of those cured meats, maybe bacon on there, maybe cheese on the sandwich, maybe mayonnaise or some type of sauce, maybe it's a cheeseburger, but sandwiches are actually the biggest contributor of sodium. So if you're eating a lot of sandwiches, think about how you could make it at home and how you could choose lower sodium options for your sandwich instead of buying a sandwich at a deli or a fast food place where it's going to be extremely high in sodium. What about sodium and table salt? So one teaspoon of table salt actually contains a day's worth of sodium. It has 2,300 milligrams. And remember, that's the absolute upper limit that you do not want to exceed in terms of your sodium intake. So that's one teaspoon of salt. And then I've broken it down from there. What about sea salt? So sea salt and table salt are both about 40% sodium by volume. So although sea salt has become popular, it still contains the same amount of sodium as regular table salt. So you cannot use it as a salt substitute. If you want to use sea salt because it's less processed and it has a few more minerals in it, you can do that as long as you know that you're using it as salt and you should be using it sparingly. But it is by no means a substitute for table salt. The American Heart Association has determined what they call the salty six, and these are the biggest contributors to sodium intake, and they really want you to focus on these. Now, a lot of these are connected. Like number one is bread, and pizza is number two, and sandwiches are number three, which all include bread. Cold cuts are number four, which are also part of a sandwich. So they're all kind of connected, but take a look at this and see what you might be eating on a regular basis and how you can choose lower sodium options. Number five is canned soup. So of course you could make homemade soup and make a low sodium version. And number six is burritos and tacos. And that would be, you know, buying them out at a restaurant. Um, but you could make a healthier version of burritos and tacos at home using a low sodium taco seasoning corn tortillas, um, and just using fresh whole ingredients instead of buying it outside your house. A quick word here about cold cuts. Cold cuts are on the list of salty six, so they are very high in sodium, and they are also considered a processed food, which is linked to higher risk of colon cancer and possibly other types of cancer. So no matter how you slice it, cold cuts are generally not recommended. But what I want to discuss specifically is the labeling around cold cuts and how it gets very confusing. So the boar's head has this deluxe ham, two ounces, 590 milligrams of sodium. They also have the same ham, branded deluxe ham, lower sodium version. This has 480 milligrams of sodium for two ounces. So it's 110 milligrams less. Is 480 milligrams low sodium? No, something can only be called low sodium if it has less than 140. But Boar's Head did not call it low sodium, they called it lower sodium. 
So when you see lower sodium, it means it's lower than the original version. It does not mean that it's low sodium. So the next time you think you're buying low sodium ham, ask the person at the deli if they have the nutritional packet from the company and look at the sodium. If it's just lower than the original, it's probably still high. If you must have deli meats, one that is a low sodium option is the no salt added turkey breast also by Boar's Head for 55 milligrams of sodium per two ounces. So please, please take a look at what you are putting in the sandwich. Look it up online if you need to get the, the sodium information. Ask somebody at the deli. But this information is available. We just have to seek it out. More tips to reduce your sodium intake. Number one is limit prepared foods, restaurants, and takeout. I cannot stress this enough. We unfortunately cannot rely on restaurants to lower the sodium in their entrees. We cannot rely on food companies to lower the sodium. We have to take responsibility for that by limiting our intake of these foods. We want to choose whole foods instead of packaged or pre-seasoned foods, and we want to cook more at home. Then we are in control of what ingredients we are using. We also want to be careful about condiments. So if you look at the photos here on the left, I have regular soy sauce. One tablespoon of regular soy sauce has 960 milligrams of sodium. Remember that ideal intake of 1,500? So one tablespoon of this soy sauce is two-thirds of a day of sodium if you're aiming towards that lower limit. But people will say, well, I use low-sodium soy sauce. Well, you really need to consider this. This product, which is a typical lower sodium soy sauce that people buy is not low sodium. It says less sodium. Less sodium means it's less than the original version. It does not mean it's low. One tablespoon of less sodium soy sauce has 575 milligrams. Is it better than the original? Yes. But is it low sodium? No. So make sure you're taking the time to read the label, look at the amount of sodium along with the serving size, and make sure you're choosing the best option for you. Another tip, of course, is to put down the salt shaker and not salt your food. Like I said earlier, salting food and adding it during cooking is only accounting for about 10% of people's sodium intake. So the biggest impact is still going to be coming from avoiding processed and um, pre-prepared foods. However, putting down your salt shaker can help. But if you do not eat any restaurant foods and you make all of your food from scratch, then you can use a little bit of salt in your cooking because that's your only intake for the day. But if you eat a high sodium diet and you eat a lot of fast food and a lot of packaged foods, there's not really any extra room to be adding the salt shaker. You want to make sure that when you're picking poultry that it has not been injected with a sodium solution. So avoid packages that say broth, saline, sodium solution, or salt. For example, this ground turkey on the left says Italian style seasoned. So that should be a hint that it's pre-seasoned. It's probably going to have added salt. When we look at the ingredient list, we can see that it does include salt. And when we look at the nutrition label, we see that four ounces has 600 milligrams of sodium. So you think, oh no, but Ground turkey is a great substitute for ground beef, but this is high in sodium, so what should I do? Well, have no fear. They have another ground turkey that does not have salt added, and for four ounces, it has 55 milligrams of sodium. So this is why it's so important to read the label and look at what is added and find the best option. It's important to read food labels carefully and to look out for words that say pickled, brine, barbecued, cured, smoked, broth, soy sauce, miso, teriyaki sauce. These words are likely going to indicate a high sodium amount. Make sure you read the nutrition facts label. Check the serving size and calculate the sodium amount based on your portion. Remember, your portion might be more than the serving size or it might be less. So you need to adjust the sodium amount based on how much you personally eat. For example, this bacon cheeseburger hamburger helper, not recommended, but has 570 milligrams of sodium in only one fourth cup as packaged. So if you have more than a fourth of a cup, if you have a half cup, that's double 
that's over 1,000 milligrams. If you have three-fourths of a cup, that's over 1,500 milligrams. So make sure you're checking two very important parts on the label, the serving size and the milligrams of sodium. Reading food labels carefully allows you to compare the labels of different brands of similar products. So if you are buying a packaged food, take a few different brands and look on the nutrition facts label so you can choose the one that has lower sodium. When you're reading labels, if you see that it says low sodium, no salt added or unsalted, these are all positive label claims. These are good. These are legit. So look for products that say that. However, if a product says reduce sodium, please understand that that does not mean it's low sodium. Reduce sodium means it's 25% less sodium than the original version, but reduce sodium does not equal low sodium. For example, this is the reduced sodium Progresso chicken and wild rice soup. One can of soup has 1,000 and 20 milligrams of sodium. A thousand milligrams of sodium is hardly low sodium, okay? It's reduced from the original version, which has a crazy amount of sodium, but it's not low. So please look at the label, see the exact milligrams of sodium, and understand that low sodium does mean low sodium, but reduced sodium does not mean low sodium. Now, of course, if you're deciding between two products and the reduced sodium is still less than their regular soup, it's a better choice, but it's still a high sodium food. So it's still not a great choice overall. Here are some examples here of foods that have no salt added or unsalted or low sodium on the label. So these would be good alternatives to the regular versions of these foods. For example, low sodium marinara sauce, low sodium canned tuna, no salt added beans, unsalted broth, salt-free breadcrumbs, no salt added cottage cheese, unsalted peanut butter. These are all labels that you wanna look for when you're in the store. Another tip for label reading is to look at the daily value. So there's the milligrams of sodium, but then if you continue over on the right, you'll see a percentage. The daily value tells you how much one serving of this food contributes to someone's totals for the day. The total daily value for sodium is based on 2,300 milligrams. It's not based on the lower ideal recommendation of 1,500, but it is based on the upper um, goal that you do not want to surpass, which is 2,300 milligrams. So if you see that a soup has 50% daily value, that means if someone's aiming for 2,300 milligrams of sodium per day, this one soup gives them 50% of their sodium for the day. That's what the daily value means. And the definitions of high and low amounts of nutrients based on daily value are as follows. So less than 5% is considered a low amount of that nutrient. So less than 5% sodium is considered low sodium on the label. More than 20% is a high sodium food or high amount of whatever nutrient you're looking at on the label. So when I showed you that container that had 44% daily value for soup, you know that's above 20, automatically you know it's a high sodium food. So it would be great if all of our foods could have about 5 to 10% daily value of sodium most of the time. But just do your best comparing brands, reading labels, but no, if it's over 20, it's a high sodium food. Regular pasta sauce is very high in sodium. Just a half cup of the prego or the ragu sauce has 480 milligrams of sodium. But don't worry, there are low sodium pasta sauces that are available. You do not have to give up all of your favorite foods. All of these options on the screen here range from 30 to 140 milligrams per sodium per half cup. That's way better than 480. So try to find these low sodium marinara sauces so you can still enjoy some of your favorite comfort foods. So you saw from the Salty Six that bread is one of the main contributors of sodium in the American diet. And it's not because one slice of bread has 
you know, such a super high amount of sodium, but it's because Americans eat so much bread. So it ends up being a large contributor. So if you do eat a lot of bread, meaning you have bread at breakfast and lunch and maybe a roll at dinner, then you really do want to look for these low sodium bread options that I have on the screen here. However, if you don't eat a lot of bread and it's just something that you enjoy here and there, then a regular slice of 100% whole grain bread would be fine. It's really your totals for the day that matter. So you can fit in some higher sodium foods if it fits in for your totals uh, for the day. But there are low sodium breads out there that I wanted you to know about. I want to show you some more substitutions that might be helpful. So for those of you that are pressed for time and are choosing to use a canned soup product versus making your own soup, keep in mind regular canned soup has a lot of sodium. So in this soup here for the entire container, it has 1700 milligrams of sodium or 74% daily value. So it's very, very high. However, the Health Valley brand makes no salt added chicken noodle soup, and this soup has 220 milligrams of sodium per container. So 1700 versus 220, clearly this one is going to be a better choice, and you still get to have the convenience of a canned soup. This brand also has other varieties like lentil, vegetable soup, minestrone, tomato, split pea, chicken and rice. You can find select varieties at Stop and Shop, Shaw's, Whole Foods, and Amazon, but make sure you're buying the no salt added version because they also have regular soups which are high in sodium. Whenever possible, buy your grains plain and season them yourself. One cup of prepared rice aroni rice pilaf has 960 milligrams of sodium versus one cup of plain prepared brown rice has zero milligrams of sodium. Here are some more examples of what we would consider processed foods and we want to work towards reducing our intake of this group of foods. So how can we season our food without salt? So I have a list here of various salt-free seasonings. The main theme here is that it includes herbs and spices. So whether you're using fresh or dried, herbs and spices can give flavor to your food. Target has a whole line of salt-free blends that I really enjoy. There's the Dash brand. Trader Joe's makes a salt-free seasoning. Um, the Bragg brand. You can also use nutritional yeast to flavor your food. This has kind of a cheesy type flavor, but it's not cheese. You can use lemon juice, lime juice, citrus tends to bring out flavors. You can use infused olive oils and vinegars. Like I love the garlic infused olive oil or the Tuscan herb infused olive oils. They can give great flavor without salt. Then there's some other seasonings and marinades that I've listed under online only. So you can look those up online if you're interested in purchasing. What about the use of potassium-based salt substitutes? If you would like to use these products, simply ask your doctor if it's okay. Because you might already be on a potassium supplement, I would be hesitant to recommend that you use these as a one-to-one -one replacement for salt for fear of getting an excessive potassium intake. So just run it past your cardiologist, and if they say it's okay, then go for it. But again, don't use excessive amounts. Just use a little bit that you need to flavor your food. Now we're going to briefly switch gears and touch on dining out. So the FDA has the menu labeling law. This requires any restaurant with 20 or more locations to post the calories directly on their menu. So this is great. And if you wanna find out additional information like sodium or saturated fat, restaurants are required to have that information accessible, but not on the menu. So they either have to have it accessible on their website or they'd have to have it in a binder in their kitchen. But if they have 20 or more locations, they do need to have the sodium content. So do not be afraid to ask or to look up the information online.
So here's an example of Dunkin' Donuts. You can find all of their nutrition information online. So I could just quickly pull this up and see that this uh, bacon, egg, and cheese croissant has 800 milligrams of sodium. Not going to be the best choice for breakfast. Also has 14 grams of saturated fat. So not a great choice, but at least I looked it up first to get this information so I can make an educated decision. You can also obtain the nutrition information for chain restaurants by visiting calorieking.com or downloading the free Calorie King app. Restaurant foods are known for being high in sodium. Adding extra salt to the food makes the customer more thirsty and then they're more likely to buy more drinks. Restaurants also add salt, of course, for a flavor agent. So we just really, really have to be careful and we need to be checking the menu and also reducing the frequency that we are eating out. For example, Asian food can be super high in sodium, like this pork lo mein that has over 2,500 milligrams of sodium or the wonton soup bowl with 2,600 milligrams of sodium. It's a lot. So make sure you're checking the website before you go, because if you had a meal like this and you do retain fluid or you have heart failure, you could gain a lot of fluid weight overnight and it could really be dangerous. Some tips for dining out. Ask for sauces and dressings on the side as these can be high in sodium, high in calories, and also high in saturated fat. Ask for no added salt and no MSG during cooking or after. Of course, there's inherently going to be salt in the foods. They probably have already prepared a lot of the sauces, but if it is at all possible that they don't add any extra salt to your meal, that would be ideal. When you're at a restaurant, remember the plate method. Have some lean protein, ask for it grilled, broiled, or baked instead of fried, and ask for it not to be seasoned with salt or the added dollop of butter that sometimes they put on top of the proteins. Think of half a plate of vegetables, but hold the butter and cheese sauce, and a quarter plate of a healthy starch, but hold that loaded potato. Ask them to go light on the cheese, as sometimes they can put a lot of cheese on products, which is high in saturated fat and sodium. And do your homework ahead of time. Check their website, look up the nutrition information, call the restaurant, see if they're open to accommodating your requests. And finally, look at your frequency of eating out. If you don't eat out a lot, it's probably not a big deal. Just go to the restaurant and enjoy your favorite meal. But if you are eating out multiple times per week, like many Americans, then when you're dining out, you really need to make adjustments to the meal to make it as heart healthy as possible. When you're dining out, there's some words that you'll notice on the menu that may give you a little indication of if it's going to be a heavier meal or a lighter meal. So we wanna choose foods that are steamed, broiled, baked, boiled or poached versus fried foods or crispy foods. We wanna choose foods that say garden fresh and they're in their own sauce instead of a buttery sauce or a cream sauce. If something says tomato sauce, although it's still gonna be high in sodium, it'll be lower in saturated fat than a sauce that says it's in gravy or a cheese sauce. We wanna look for things that are roasted, marinated in juice or wine versus marinated in butter and oils. We wanna look for things that are grilled. Um, we wanna look for things that might be in a marinara sauce, although it's high in sodium. If it said meat sauce, that would mean that it also has red meat, which would be higher in saturated fat. So we're kind of you know, choosing the lesser um, of the two, but really just keep some of these words in mind when you're reading the menu. And finally, don't forget to spread happiness wherever you go.